Nightlight, everybody. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is Nightlight, a reminder that you're never alone. We have an amazing guest tonight. Uh, her name is Kathleen McGowan, and she is um, an Hello. amazing... Hi, we're here. I'm introducing you. Oh, sorry. So that's okay. Let me, let me, let me tell everybody how fabulous you are. Um, <laughs> She broke um, international publi publishing records with her debut novel, The Expected One, about the life of Mary Magdalene. And she is a New York Times bestselling author of three works of fiction and one spiritual nonfiction about the power of prayer called The Source of Miracles. She's currently working on the fourth novel in her series about England's most controversial queen, Anne Boleyn. And she's also a regular commentator on the History Channel and can be seen on every season on the show, which has become a global phenomenon, Ancient Aliens. Definitely <clears throat> a feather in her cap for sure. I first met her because of her books, The Expected One, um, at the series. It, it's called the Mad Madeline um, series, the Madeline line. And I fell in love with the books, and uh, I'm an avid reader. I can read easily a book a day, and it it the the books caught me. First of all, it caught me because you fall in love with the characters, and that's a very very hard thing to do to to put that kind of emotion into your writing so that people just love the characters. And secondly, because I'm a, I'm a history freak and, and I am definitely involved in, you, you all know, the, the Bible stuff and all of that, plus the paranormal connections to it all. And I found that her books were, were an amazing way of, of seeing another side of history. And I have to admit that I did fact check her here and there on some of the stuff. And I got to the point where I was just done fact checking her because she has the amazing talent of weaving a story through history so that she teaches you not only the history, but other aspects and other philosophies and other ways of looking at different things that have historically happened. So I, I have lately reread the books again coming from, again, another perspective, because, you know, clearly we're all growing and we're all learning, so that when you reread something that you loved in the first place, you begin to see different nuances and different signals and, and different aspects of them as you read them, <clears throat> excuse me, a second and possibly a third time. The, um, the, the, the books just catch your imagination and, and they take you on a trip. You're there with her. And you're not only going through the history of, of the regions, of the areas that she's taking you into, you're getting another perspective on, on the spiritual, the religious aspects of how she weaves this book around. So welcome to the show, Kathleen. I'm so sorry we had so much trouble getting in, but I'm so delighted that you're here tonight. Well, thank you, Barbara. I am delighted to be here, and thank you for the introduction. I wish you could just follow me around and tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you've got you've got an amazing gift here. I mean, and you know, it. I find that that some people can write a good story, and and, and it's a good story, and it's okay, and I enjoyed it. But you know, you put it down, you go away, and you forget the story. Um, with the the way that you have created the characters in this series you know them and i love the way that you you have interwoven within the story um you've used their names to connect them to historical stuff that we knew about so that there's almost a recognition of a truth that is underlying and buried within the story that you don't really recognize but you know you've been sort of uh, sort of jerked awake to another spiritual aspect and level and and um, arena of of understanding of history and and how history is the foundation upon which we are built and therefore we need to understand it more deeply than we do and and frankly our history is is 
has been manipulated and rewritten so many times that so many people don't really know what the truth of history is. Well, that's absolutely true. And, you know, these books take me a, a long time to write. I don't, you know, I don't have a book that comes out every year because it takes, you know, I, well, I've been researching these books for 20 years now. I'm in my 22nd year of doing research on this material. Um, and the books take years to write. And the reason they do is because um, every page, every word, every sentence is actually very carefully crafted. Um, there is nothing that is random in these books. And that's why people do read them uh, multiple times and, and say that every time that they read it, they get something new out of it. Um, because I've written them in a, in a way that I call layered learning, where the more you read them, the more you will, you will see, the more that will become apparent to you. So it's, it's a very long and laborious process to create these books. Um, but it is certainly a, a labor of love. I'm so blessed to be able to do this. Well, it, and and when you have a project like this, it isn't just that you got an idea someday and thought, oh, this will be commercially well, you know, wonderful. I mean, this has to be something that 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 was um, spiritually inspired for you to start on. And when did that happen? When did you when did you start to 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 work with this sort of inspiration and weave it into what it has become? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is I didn't start out to write fiction at all in the first place. Um, so what happened to me is in the, in the early 90s, I was still working for the studios. I was working for the Walt Disney Company, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I worked with some extraordinary people there. I worked with the, the old animators who had worked with Walt. Uh, and one of them specifically was a wonderful, wonderful man named Mark Davis. And Mark Davis was a huge uh, influence um, on my life during that period of time because he was really committed to the power of story. He was in many ways the backbone of what became the Disney legacy. Um, Mark Davis created things that are you know, everyday words for us. You know, he created Pirates of the Caribbean and he created the Haunted Mansion and Adventureland and Disneyland was created for him. He created Bambi and Tinkerbell and um, Alice in Wonderland and the great villains that um, we all love, Maleficent and Cruella de Vil. Um, but most of all, he was an extraordinary storyteller. And I got to spend a lot of time with Mark. We traveled together and we used to talk a lot about story. Um, and he was actually the one who told me that I needed to get out of my day job, which was working for Disney, as glamorous as it was, and I needed to go and start doing the work that I was really here to do, because we used to talk for hours about writing. And my passion was writing about women. I was very, you know, firmly in the, in the place of believing and understanding that women had been given a bad rap in history. And if, any, if anyone had been maligned and, and, and misunderstood throughout history, it was women, and that I really wanted to do something about that. But what I set out to do originally when I, I finally had the courage to to say I'm going to stop, you know, I'm going to stop my day job. I'm going to start focusing on what I know in my heart I'm really here to do. And that was a huge leap for me. That was a big leap of faith. And, and, and the most important thing I think I've ever done in my life um, was to believe in myself and say, I know that I have to follow this. It just became so strong. Um, but I didn't really know where I was going. I just knew I had to go. So what I did is I made a list of the women who I believed I wanted to write about. Uh, and there were 15 women on the original list and they were women who I believed had been uh, misrepresented that I wanted to defend. I was gonna go out and defend these women. Now I was coming from a nonfiction point of view at this point. I was going to write a nonfiction book about these women. And in that top 15 were Marie Antoinette, Lucretia Borgia, uh, and certainly Mary Magdalene. Now, the funny thing about Mary Magdalene is I did not have any kind of spiritual connection to her at this point. The only reason I had chosen Mary Magdalene initially was because she was so obvious. She, she was the queen of the maligned and misunderstood because we knew she'd been intentionally maligned because the church had admitted it. So we have this event in, in, the, in 1969 where the Vatican comes out and says, oops, you know, Mary Magdalene should not be viewed as a fallen woman when in fact she's the apostle of the apostles and they explain the whole story about how mary magdalene was given this reputation by pope gregory the great uh in the year 599 and how he invented her as a prostitute to create this icon of repentance etc cetera, etc cetera. so i loved the fact that we knew that mary magdalene had been intentionally defamed for the purposes of giving the church an icon of repentance, because that proved my theory. 
So my initial start was I was going to investigate this idea of Mary Magdalene as the maligned woman. And I was going to do it in France because I knew that she had come to France following the crucifixion. There was heavy historical documentation of this. There was also information in my own family because I have a French uh, line that dates back to the southwest of France. And so I went there in search of her story, again, originally from a totally nonfiction perspective. And once I got to France and the story began to unravel for me, I really was Alice. I fell through the looking glass and I have never come back from it. <laughs> well, I can understand that. And, and certainly um, from, from the book, uh, books, I, I mean, you, you are very connected, obviously, to the main character. I mean, you gave her your name. Um, and I love the way that, that you have, you have identified that throughout history and and you did it with Joan of Arc you, you, she's mentioned I mean there are a number of women that are mentioned all of who have the same physical attributes as as Mary did as as you have and so it it just to me it was like yeah I mean I do think that I do believe I, I believe in reincarnation and so I, I do believe that that spirits not necessarily souls and personalities but spirits do move dimension <laughs> to dimension to dimension and they do reincarnate in different ways and shapes in order to carry on what what it is they need to learn and what it is they need to teach so it, it you know it, the story makes great sense to me and you know, I, I and I love the fact that you 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 bring you know back. Um, is it Longinus or is it? Um, yes, Longinus. Yeah, Longinus. Um, I love the fact that you bring him back in the second book. So it just it 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 makes history more readable. I mean, you know, come on, let's 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 be honest. You know, uh, the King's English. Um, you know, is uh, Saint. Um, you know, the Bible was translated into Latin and then into English, and and it was it was put in 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 European in in the language of the nobility, so that so that the common man wouldn't have the faintest idea of what was in the book, so that the common man wasn't able to read the book. So I'm writing about that in my new book, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> Are you really? <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> No, and so so it's it's sort of like there is such an amazing story here, and there's a love story here too, and 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 the Bible sure as hell doesn't doesn't bring it out. So that it's it's really, I mean, there there are um, you know, there are books up that could have been put in the Bible that would have skewed the story tremendously, and it's a shame they haven't, and it's also a shame they haven't been given the the. Uh, the same stamp of approval that those that were put into the Bible. The Bible was created by Constantine and Eusebius and his mother. I mean, it did. It, it was definitely a very um, careful selection of, of putting material together that would be able to be used as the foundation for a church. And and it wasn't necessarily focused on the truth. No. And divine intervention occurs uh, first in the late 1800s and then in 1945 when these other Gnostic Gospels are discovered in Egypt. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden we have more information about the early church than we've ever had. Uh, and it plays out all of these theories that we have. Uh, the Gnostic Gospels, the Nag Hammadi Kash specifically, but also the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which was found earlier. The Gnostic Gospels are so important to the understanding of this story, and I definitely recommend that anyone who is interested in these subjects, who has not read them, uh, you know, run, uh, don't walk, and read this material, specifically the Gospel of Philip, which talks about sacred union, uh, you know, this idea of, of what it is to be holy and in, in love and connected. Um, and how this also applies to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. By the way, you can find all of those things online for free. Um, there is a website called earlychristianwritings.com, I believe, which has all of the Gnostic Gospels available. Um, there's so many resources where you can look for these things. But, you know, one of the, the story that I wanted to tell here is that um, I did years and years and years of research after sort of falling into this rabbit hole 
Uh, you know, I was walking around France going, how is it possible that, no that nobody talks about this? You know, it's it's everywhere. It's 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 in the landscape. It's in the people. It's in the culture. It's in the architecture. This story is alive and nobody is talking about it. And I became very determined to talk about it. So um, I did these years of research and I put together what I thought was a great nonfiction book. Uh, and in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s at this stage, I went out to the publishing world and people said, no way. Absolutely not. There's no way anyone is going to publish this book. You can't rewrite history this way. You can't certainly can't rewrite biblical history. You're a woman. You're not an academic. You're not a scholar. Uh, it just looks like revisionist history. No one is going to take it seriously. And um, no matter what I did, I couldn't get the publishing world to take me seriously. And my point was, look, the fact that I'm not an academic is a, is part of the story I'm trying to tell, that there is so much information in these landscapes and in these cultures where people celebrate this every day, there are places in the south of France where they can say, and this is where Mary Magdalene taught, and this is where she washed her clothes, and you know, they revere her relics, which are which are there. Um, and yet people, you know, around the world just have no idea. So it was after you know being rejected and having so many doors slammed in my face that I went through this really dark night of the soul period where I was like, what do I do now? I know that this story is true. I know that this is a bigger story that has to be told. Um, it's a story about women. It's a story about love. It's a story about truth. You know, this is the greatest story never told, and I need to tell it. And so I went, I had to kind of go into this sort of meditational hibernation and say, what does this mean? What am I missing? Because also my path, my journey to this information was completely magical. I was divinely guided everywhere. I mean, it, it was unbelievable the amount of help I had from the upstairs department while I was doing this research. So I knew that none of it was random. I knew that it had to be done. And so it was in going through this period um, where I ultimately realized rejection is protection, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I say to people all the time. You know, when you get the door slamming your face the hardest is when you have to step back and say, what am I being protected from? Because that's what was happening to me. Um, I was being protected because the material needed to be looked at in a new way. And that was when I went back to uh, my Irish roots as a storyteller. I went back to listen, sitting at Mark Davis's feet and listening to him talk about the power of story. This understanding that humans are hardwired to listen to a story well told. And I realized these books are not meant to be written as nonfiction. They're not meant to be history books. Um, they're meant to be beautiful stories that people can connect to with their hearts. The problem with nonfiction is it's strictly cerebral. It strictly comes at you from your brain and your mental spaces. And what these stories needed to do were touch you in your heart and in your spirit and connect with you in ways that only spirit can do and only story can do. And that is when I said, I need to rethink this. And that was when I rewrote the expected one, uh, started writing the expected one as fiction. Well, you know, it, it's funny because I came, <clears throat> this goes by, now it was published in 200, 2005? Uh, it was published, I self-published it in 2004 because still no one would publish it even after I wrote it as a book. Lots of people read it and said, People in the publishing world said the book is fantastic. It's too controversial. You can't write. You you can't publish this book. Um, and that went on for years. And then the Da Vinci Code came out, and I was absolutely shattered. I was so angry when the Da Vinci Code came out because I said, "Wait a minute! You know, everyone told me I could not publish this book because I couldn't talk about this concept of Jesus and Mary Magdalene being married that the world wasn't ready for it." And now the Da Vinci Code has come out, and I felt like Don Dan Brown has stolen my destiny, right? Ah. Uh, this, this 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 can't be, and I was so angry about it. Um, and I'd also been told going back that one of the reasons I could not publish The Expected One was because I was a woman. I'd been told that several times, that it felt like feminist revisionism uh, and that kind of thing, and that it was okay for Dan Brown to do it because he was a man uh, and he was a well-known thriller author but, author, but it was not okay for me. So again, here we, I come, I have to step back into this. I had this dark night of the soul period where I was like, oh my gosh, um, now I've spent, you know, 10 years of my life creating this book and now no one will touch it. 
And so then again, I had to step back and say, what am I, what's happening here? And I realized that I, I had to believe in myself. So I started my own publishing company. I published it myself in 2004. I self-published it. And this is before the days of eBooks. So I was mm -hmm. selling books out of my garage um, and it was not easy. Uh, and then it was in proving that um, I had an audience uh, for this book that I had self-published that ultimately I was picked up by uh, a wonderful agent and then picked up by Simon & Schuster. So then it went global in July of 2006 was the global release of the expected one. And that was when it broke international publishing records because it's now in 50 languages worldwide. In, in 2006, I was... I was um one of the things that I did was I was a minister in a spiritualist church for about five years. And one of the people came up to me after one of the services and said, you have to read this book and then talk to me. And she gave me your book. And I read it. And the following Sunday, I, I you know, said, okay, I read it. It's a terrific book. Um, why did I have to read it? And she said, because I think I'm re the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene. And I said, I, I would buy that you certainly have a level of her consciousness. <coughs> um, and and I, I, you know, there's no way of knowing she could have been. But, but, um, it, it, but the book touched me so, so tremendously that, that, of course, I ate up the other two when they came out like, like there was no tomorrow. And, and it made me realize that, that, you know, she just, she turned me on to something that would at some point in time really change my life as well. And I, I, I really um, feel that, that it's interesting because, you know, you talk about Dan Brown stealing your ideas, but, but before Dan Brown, there was Holy Blood, Holy Grail by Henry Lincoln and his friends mm -hmm. that, that basically, you know, gave Dan Brown the foundation for what he did. So right, and I had read all those books before I went to France. I, of course, I'd read Holy Blood, Holy Grail. I'd read Woman with the Alabaster Jar by Margaret Starbird. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, think I have to give Margaret Starbird her due. She's really, she was really the pioneer on this this subject matter, uh, and I have to, you know, always give her credit for that. Um, so you know, this this material was out there. It's just that Dan Brown took it to the masses in a way that had never happened before. And I also want to go back and say, ultimately. Dan Brown was the best thing that ever happened to me. I didn't realize it at the time, um, but he really opened doors for me because um, the Da Vinci Code is, you know, one one hundredth, well, maybe one one thousandth of the information that I have in the expected one. And I think that people would not have been ready for the expected one if the Da Vinci Code had not come out first. So in a lot of ways, I really feel like Dan Brown had to come before me. He had to open these doors because I think a lot of people would not have been ready for what I had to say if he had not done that. So in the end, um, I think everything happened in divine order. Oh, at, well, yeah, it, it, it does have a way of doing that in spite of us. Um, I think what, what, what amazes me so thoroughly is that the gen, and I've often said, always said that, 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 that the truth is actually usually presented to us in, in forms of fiction to make us ready to accept the reality of the truth that they carry. And I have always felt, I have always been amazed by um, the fact that people are, they're, they're just fine to accept the fact that, you know, aliens came to this planet and, and manipulated our DNA and that we're probably hybrids of many alien races and stuff like that. But they absolutely don't want to accept the fact that Jesus and Mary had children and that their bloodline still does exist. I know it's so funny. It, it is. The, church, the church says the church acknowledges the idea of uh, aliens and other life forms, but can't acknowledge the idea that Jesus was married. It's quite funny actually. Well, it, uh, well, of course there are a whole bunch of old men and dirty robes sitting in caves. So, you know, they, they aren't going to be, have a romantic, bone in their body as far as that goes but they were creating a religion and again what 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 blows me away is that the foundation of the re religion you know the, the loving each other as you love you know love love each other as you love yourself and and you know and god and that's really all it is and and yet they have built dogma around it to the point where they have drowned out the absolute truth behind the religion 
Well, that's because they were building a world power. They weren't building a spiritual environment. So as soon as you begin to build an, an environment where it, your focus is power and economics, um, you are by nature no longer a spiritual authority. And that's really what happened. I mean, the Vatican became a world, a global superpower. Uh, it was, it is, it will always be probably. Um, and at that stage, spirituality goes out the window because this whole concept of all you need is, you know, yourself and God. Jesus says, go into your room, close the door and talk to God. He does not say you need an intermediary. He does not say that you need a church. He says you need to have a relationship with the divine. So when we look at what Jesus is actually saying, it's certainly contradictory to the way that um, institutionalized Christianity, you know, evolves. Um, I wear a bracelet that says Matthew 22, which is, you know, love God, love each other, love yourselves. And, you know, that's that's it. That's that's all you need to know. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things that Peter says, my character Peter says in the book of love. It's like what Jesus was teaching was really, really simple. Um, and and when we got away from that, uh, that's when everything started to fall apart. Yeah. And, and it, it it almost started to fall apart immediately. Well, it looks like immediately this way. But but yeah, I mean, the what the uh, Bible was actually put together about. 335 BC in there someplace. Three, th well, uh, in, in the fourth century AD, actually. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> if you, I'm talking about the New Testament, not talking about the Old Testament. So right, right. Um, well, you know, and you also have this issue of what's happening with women, what happens with women in the early church. Um, and we see, you know, over and over again as we look at some of the early writings and, and the newer things that came out in the last hundred years. Um, with the Gnostic material, that women were in positions of authority. Um, we know now that, you know, uh, Peter, the Apostle Peter was married and that um, he had a daughter who was uh, an important missionary. There are a lot of, you know, very, very important women in the early church who were then eradicated. And I believe, as I say in my books, that one of the reasons that this crackdown came on feminine authority was the power of Mary Magdalene, because Mary Magdalene was establishing her own authority outside of church authority. What was happening in Rome is very different from what is happening in France. So it's the difference, you know, I always say it's Roma versus Amor, right? They mm -hmm. are the of each other. So what's happening in Rome is ultimately this institutionalized Christianity is growing. And what's happening in France is this beautiful, expansive, uh, spiritual teaching of love and community and faith uh, is growing. And ultimately, those two things are going to come into clash in the Middle Ages when the church decides that what's happening in France is far too dangerous, growing far too quickly. There are far too many women involved and it has to be eradicated. And that's when they declare the crusades against the Cathars, against the descendants of Mary Magdalene in the 13th century. Yeah, and that was that was an amazing massacre. I mean, it was, uh, when you stop and think about, you know, Christians killing Christians, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and yet, it did. It did challenge their the the philosophy, the dogma that the church had built up. That that you know, just it took away the effect of the feminine. And what gets you is, you know, if you don't have the feminine and the masculine together, you don't have a balance. No, of course not. But they weren't looking for balance in Rome, were they? They were looking for power. Power is the, the power is the opposite of balance. Power is completely destroying the balance so that you can control something. And so in order to do that, you have to eradicate that other piece. And in this case, it was the feminine. So what we have happening in France in the early Middle Ages, in the, in the 1100s, is we have this beautiful culture that's flourishing. We have the troubadour culture, uh, this whole, this beautiful concept of, of love and art, this concept that they called parache, which was this beautiful idea of living in, uh, in, in beauty and celebration of what it is to be alive and, 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 to be in, and to be in body, to resurrect while in this body, which is one of the things uh, that is said in the Gnostic Gospels. So you have this beautiful thing happening in the south of France where women are equal to men, or uh, as my friend Isabel says, uh, where men are equal to women. Uh, <laughs> but you have, you have an egalitarian culture of beautiful spirituality and art growing. And what's happening is noble women who are uh, wealthy and own land and have power 
are very attracted to what's happening with Catharism because it celebrates them as women in their strength. Now, on the other side over in Rome, you have you have the church saying things like, and this is a quote from a letter uh, from a church father that said, women are equal to bags of excrement. You have letters from the church father saying, women are all eaves. Um, it talks about them being the gateway to hell, this belief system that women uh, don't have souls and are, are the, the, the um, source of all corruption and evil. So you have this kind of information coming out of the church versus what's happening in France, which is this amazing, beautiful spiritual celebration. And it, it comes to a tipping point where this culture is growing so much in France that the church has to take a stand in order to protect its power. And what it does is so brutal, had never been seen before in history. The largest mass burnings to this day in human history is an absolute genocide. We still don't know how many people were massacred during this period from 1209 to 1321, because this persecution lasts over a hundred years and it goes all the way across Europe, not just in France. There are massacres in Italy, there are massacres in other places, predominantly in France and central Italy. But we, hundreds of thousands of people, it's said that it could even be millions of people, were massacred during this attempt to eradicate this beautiful culture. Absolutely genocide. Yeah, and and it, it, it it's not it, it's men, women, and children and babies. They took no, uh, they they didn't they didn't spare anybody. It was it was just wipe them out, and and it was horrible. It, it was worse than the Christians and the Romans and the and the lions and stuff like that. It was far worse than that. Um, oh, it absolutely was. And that's where that's where the expression "kill kill them all and let God sort them out" comes from. Um, that comes from the, the massacre of the, of, the, of the city of Bézier um, on July 22nd uh, in 1209. Now, July 22nd is when a number of the massacres happened, and you probably know that July 22nd is the feast day of Mary Magdalene. So mm -hmm. the most horrific ma uh, massacres, uh, some of them were saved for that date so the church could make their point that this kind of reverence for Mary Magdalene was never going to be acceptable um, in the church. But at the massacre of Bézier, when the, the, the papal authority um, came forward and said, when we go into Bézier, how do we how do we know who to kill? How do we tell the Catholics from the Cathars? Uh, they were told uh, by the papal legate, the, the representative of the Pope said, kill them all, God will know his own. And that was the beginning of the worst, uh, the worst massacre at that point in human history, the siege of Bézier, when 25 to 30,000 people, every single living being in the town was massacred from the youngest baby to the oldest, to the oldest person. And somewhere between three to 6,000 people took refuge in, in the cathedral in the center of town, cathedral which was dedicated to Mary Magdalene. Uh, and the, the, the envoys, the armies of the Pope, actually locked them into the cathedral and burned the cathedral to the ground. So every human being was was killed. Um, and again, as you said, this is Christian against Christian. You know, this is a really, really dark moment in human history. So what we have to do is one, we have to talk about it because this issue of genocide is still happening all over the world in our time. But two, we need to look at what were they trying to what were they trying to kill? What were they really trying to eradicate? What they were trying to eradicate was was the truth, and it's our mission to bring that truth back. One one of the I I know that Anne Boleyn is definitely the focus of your next book, which fascinates me. I can't see how you're going to weave that in, but I'm sure you're going to do it beautifully. Did you look at uh, is this is this going to be an ongoing series? Are you going to really step into other places? I mean, because Joan of Arc has come up here as one of the expected one ones. Do you, do you ever touch upon now? I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I do. Eight fifty three, Pope Joan. Oh, I love Pope. I love the Pope Joan story. I will not do Pope Joan uh, in my books simply because um, I, I think that. Uh, oh, oh gosh, what's the what is the the author's name? I think it's Joan Cross. Uh, there was a wonderful book called Pope Joan. Uh, a fantastic historical novel that came out um, about 10 years ago, about the same time as the expected one. And it was so good. It was so well written that for me, there's just no reason for me to take on that story because it's been done really, really beautifully by another female author who I just respect. 
Um, and so I wish I could uh, remember her name off the top of my head. Um, but if you go to Amazon for Pope Joan, you'll see, you'll see it. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic book, but yes, in terms of my series, um, I am going forward. I originally was going to be a trilogy, but there's just too much to say. So we have moved from trilogy into series, um, because there are just too many stories to be told. And, uh, so we're going to keep going. I'm, I'm really glad because first of all, it's fascinating. And second of all, uh, you do fall in love with the characters. And, and, you know, please don't kill anybody off because that <laughs> devastates me. Um, <laughs> I, I realize in 50 years or so, someone's got to go. But um, it just, to me, it's, it's such a, <clears throat> it, it's, it gives you a better understanding. It makes, you, you know, when you, when you hear the story in the Bible, they're talking about a savior or a God and stuff like that. And your book makes everybody real people and 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 i do believe jesus was a real person as well as everything else but but it it brings them down to a human place where you can relate to them and i think that's what the bible doesn't do and and it makes it gives you a better sense of of being able to embrace the aspect of uh love conquers all well i think that um the whole concept of making these people human uh, is really the point of fiction. You know, fiction allows us to step into this world with our characters. It allows us to feel with them, to love with them, to laugh with them, to cry with them, to see how they are like us uh, in so many ways. And, and, and that is the beauty of fiction. You know, and you touched on something too that you said earlier um, about what you know, fiction allows us. And, and the amazing and beautiful irony for me as an author is that fiction gave me the freedom to tell the truth in a way that nonfiction never could, right? Oh um, yeah. So, and that was that was the, the sort of beautiful realization when I decided to write fiction was, oh my gosh, all the shackles are off of me now. I can now do whatever I want. I don't have to footnote everything. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can get rid of all of these constraints and I, I can really just dive into the humanity of these stories because these were real people um these you know these were not these are not icons on the wall these were flesh and blood humans who laughed and loved and felt uh and cried and and held their babies and and kissed each other good night and and that's what i really wanted to get to with these stories is i wanted you know to to pull you into history so to show you that you know these are human stories well, and, you know, usually you look in at the statues in the churches and the, and the stained glass windows and, and all of the monuments out there, and they are cold. Yeah. You, you put warmth and love into, into biblical figures that, that we're here to serve in love. And it does, you know, it, 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 it is a story that I swear to you, um, it, it, I think it, 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 there must be a new wave of, of awareness that has touched humanity because it does feel like this is a time where people will read these stories and, you know, understand that it's fiction, but also understand that there is an inner truth there that resonates to their very spirit. And that's what makes it wonderful because you see them as human, you see them loving and compassionate towards each other and humanity. And that's the other thing that, that there are many people, you know, everyone here has a purpose, obviously, or they wouldn't be here, but, but some have a, a cause and a purpose above and beyond whatever it is they're, they're here to do for their independent spirit. There are people here who have a greater cause that they have to answer and it drives them. It drives the people, no matter what they are driven to to do something, to put something out there, to leave uh, leave the crumbs for, along the trail for those who are not yet as awake. And, and I think, I truly believe that's what your books do. Well, thank you. My late husband used to say that I was a lighthouse. You know, he said, your job is to, is to, is to shed light um, so that people can find, can find these truths. Um, you know, go out there and be a lighthouse and put this information out there. And, you know, the people who need to find it will find it. 
And I always liked that that imagery, you know. Well, that's beautiful. that's how the show got its name. It's Nightlight. Oh, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I I decided that that spiritually speaking, people had they didn't have an idea as to what spirituality was. They just, you know, I'm on a spiritual pathway. Fine. What are you doing? What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm on a spiritual pathway. Fine. How are you manifesting that spirituality into your in, in, in that man, that that aspect into your reality? Well, I read books and go to classes, but how do you manifest that belief? In other words, are you living the philosophy that you've gathered, or are you just a parrot preaching it? Mm, right. And and that's that was the purpose for the show. Um, what, seven, eight years ago when it started, um, it was like, you know, I'll do psychic readings, but I teach in them. I do um, I do interviews with people like you and, and sort of put the information out there and, and something that you, you write in all of your books for those with ears to hear or eyes to see. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's exactly what I feel the purpose of this show is, to, to put it out there and let it trigger an opening and awareness in other people's consciousnesses so that they seek out what it is they're here to do. Well, and, and first of all, um, bravo for you or brava for you for doing this show for such a long time. Cause I, I know a number of people who listen to it and love you and love the show and you're doing great work in the world. So thank you for that. Um, and I, I think that, you know, now more than ever, and, and, you know, because you've been doing this for such a long time, um, I have a question for you. And that is, have you noticed what I have noticed, which is how much consciousness of the planet has changed in the last 10 years? So, oh. for example, when the expected one came out in 2006, it was so controversial that people didn't know what to do with it. And now, 10 years later, it's not the least bit controversial, really. I mean, there are still people who bristle at it. And Hollywood is still not brave enough to show a Mary Jesus on the screen, believe me. But overall, I feel like since from 2006 to 2016, we have made enormous leaps in terms of collective consciousness. Oh, when I started in this field, I could have lost my job. I taught school. And I, I taught school for 25 years. I, I taught handicapped children. But... If they knew what I was involved in, they had, they could have, you know, triggered the moral clause in my contract. I could have lost my job. Wow. And by the time I got, you know, to the point where I, I, I left teaching and, and took this on full time, um, I was doing readings on lunch hours for, for other teachers. So, yes, I mean, absolutely. And, and of late, I would say the last decade for sure. There has been a su such a shift in consciousness that that even even going into a a, a greater um, level or or layer of, of spiritual understanding that that it, you even see the the attendance at churches falling off because people are understanding that that the spirit it within them does not need a building to evolve into. No, but you know what I'm finding people what they are realizing is that they need community and uh -huh. this is this is the beautiful thing that i see see happening i see it on facebook we have a we have a beautiful community on facebook for example i see that more and more people are looking to come together to find other like-minded and like-spirited people to come together and share with but they are finding that they don't need to do it in a in a specific building or within a specific set of dogmatic rules i mean one of the most i i think if I had to choose on this amazing journey I've been on for the last 10 years, the, the single most fulfilling aspect for me just as a, as a human is the number of, of letters I've had from people who have said that these books have brought them back to something um, that they had turned their backs on because so many people reached a place where they said, I can't be a part of institutionalized religion because it's too dogmatic. And they threw the baby out with the bath bathwater. They completely walked away from it. And so one of the things that I try to do with my books is say, look, this is all still available to you in this beautiful way that you can discover all on your own or in a community, but does not have to be dogmatic. This is really about you finding your own divine connection, finding mm -hmm. it within yourself and finding your own way to the divine. And so for me, if my books have helped people to do that, then I am a very, very happy woman. 
I think also it's your, your books help people to realize that that they do have the answer inside. They do have the power and, and the grace inside and they don't need to have an intermediary to, to talk to God. And, and that was the point of the Book of Love. I mean, the Book of Love, the expected one is the book that gets all the attention. Uh, but the Book of Love is, is my is my masterpiece for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, when I when I wrote the end on the Book of Love, I I just I realized I have done what I have come here to do. Uh, even if I never do anything else, this is the work I came to do. And, you know, the Book of Love is is it is it is is me and my work and my reason for being, you know, in those pages, because that's what that book is about. It is all about understanding um, how much we have within ourselves and how much life is all about love, but that love has to start with you. Uh Um, And, and so that, that's, that's the reason for being for that book. And it's why I talk about the labyrinths and I talk about different tools that you can use, you know, in order to find these connections for those people who have not yet figured out how to do that. So I tried to create within the power of the story of this amazing woman, Matilda, who completely obsessed me once I discovered her gigantic statue in the middle of the Vatican, and nobody could tell me why this woman was in the middle of the Vatican. I said, I'm gonna find out why. And Matilda took me by the hand. Sometimes I say she took me by the throat and took me on this journey to figure out who she was and what she had to say. And that is what she stood for. Um, You know, she stood for this idea um, of the book of love. And it was a story that I I believe I was born, born to tell. And it is the thing I am most proud of in my career. Well, I sat and cried. I, I just absolutely sat and cried. It was so beautifully written and, and, uh, touching. But you got the poet prince too, and that's a cool story as well. I mean, well, the poet prince is, is the stepchild who uh, who really didn't get very much attention um, because, unfortunately, I was at war with my publisher when that book came out. Uh, <laughs> um, and the poet prince is a great book, and it, you know, I actually was talking with someone on Facebook. Uh, who posted the other day that it was her favorite book, and she said all the reasons why she loved the Poet Prince. And I said, you know, I I, I have a special place in my heart for people who love the Poet Prince because, you know, I, I think that book is really special and and just never really received as much attention as, as it deserved because this story of what was happening in the Renaissance, of who Lorenzo de' Medici was, who the Medici family were in Florence, and what they were doing to actually create the artistic movement which becomes the Renaissance and why they were doing it and and what they were trying to convey through art is such an important story that's been lost and um, it was you know it's a story again that I was driven to tell and it was the first time that I I wanted to tell a story where there was a man at the center of it where um, where a man and a and a whole family of men had also been maligned and misunderstood and they had been attacked because they were brave enough to say, we oppose the dogmatic institutionalized version of the church and we support this beautiful idea of spirituality and we're going to find ways to convey this to people through art. And that story is so important. Uh, so thank you for mentioning the Poet Prince because- um, How can you not? <laughs> <laughs> no, we got, we've got to come out. You're gonna hear music in a few minutes. So let's not get into anything too juicy, but the Poet Prince I loved. I mean, you, and again, the characters you created, you know, you, you kind of, that, that there's, there's a support to the main character in your, in your first two books that is so obviously there and so powerful and doesn't, doesn't get his due either. So, um, and are you talking, are you talking about Longinus? Yeah, that and, 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 uh, Bellinger. This is Nightlight, and if you like what you're hearing, click over to the support page and make a donation to help us keep this amazing station up and running. Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com is totally listener-supported. From the owner to the host to the producers, who we can't live without, to the staff, all are working here because we love the work and are dedicated to putting out quality material for all of you, be it large or small, Every donation is greatly appreciated and helps us all keep on supplying information and material to educate and enlighten you that isn't found anywhere else. 
So we're back, Kathleen. Hi. Hi. I, I just, we were talking while we were go going and um, it, it's kind of, it, time is flying here. It's really kind of sad that we're not, you know, I'm not covering as much as I'd like to, but we're covering more than I had figured we would be able to. So in, in a way, you know, it's great. Um, I, I would, I was really kind of going back, kind of in my mind. I mean, we've talked about this series, and and it is a phenomenal series. If you like history, and if you if you like hearing about some of the truth that is out there, this is definitely these are definitely books that you you want to read, and not just because it it depicts a strong woman through and women throughout history. But because the message is so important for today, especially um, the the element of love and compassion and sharing and kindness seems to be out the window in so many places. So it it really it it is something that that is important for us to remind society about. And one of the 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 lines, the phrases that you have woven through all of the books is the time returns. So you want to explain kind of what that is. <laughs> Um, the time returns. Uh, there's, there's, a, there are two phrases actually that work together, and the one that I've been, I've used in the last two books is the time returns, and the one that you will see in the next book, which is the phrase that Anne Boleyn used, is the time will come. And these two phrases work together. These were both phrases that were used by these Gnostic Christian uh, slash heretical uh, communities in um, in Europe over the course of the last two thousand years. Now, the time returns is a really interesting phrase which uh, shows up in the early teachings. And the idea of the time returns, one of the things that's fascinating about it is it speaks to um, an understanding of reincarnation uh, within a Christian framework. So there's a very interesting question about did Jesus actually teach reincarnation? There's some wonderful books about, uh, about this idea uh, that re more, more references to reincarnation may actually have uh, existed in the early Christian writings than we were ultimately given access to. Mm -hmm. um, but this concept of the time returns is that there are periods in human history where um, we come back and we come back together, we reincarnate together. There's this idea of soul families, that we come back together in groups to perform a specific mission. And that though that mission or missions um, always involve raising the level of human consciousness. So we have periods of time where we see that this was happening. We know that it was happening certainly during the first century, during this mission that Jesus and Mary Magdalene um, are, are creating and executing. Um, we see it happen with the rise of Catharism uh, in the southwest of France. So we're looking at various periods in time where people come back and are very, very focused on really shifting the energy or the vibration of the planet. Now, what's very interesting about this is the last Cathar leader uh, was a man named Gu uh, Guillaume Bellibast, and he was executed by the church, burned at the stake in 1321. He was the last Cathar burned that we, uh, that we have in recorded history. And when he went to the stake, uh, he said, the laurel will turn green again. Now, the laurel was the emblem of the Cathar people. So to say that the laurel would turn green was to say that this, these teachings um, of love and peace and art and joy and faith would return when the world was ready for it. The time would come when the world would be ready for it. And that time uh, would be 700 years in the future. So this becomes known as the Belabast prophecy. Belabast says from, his, from the stake, uh, the laurel will turn green again, we will come back. The time will come, the time will return uh, 700 years from now. Now he spoke that prophecy in 1321. So the Belabast prophecy speaks to the year 2021 as a time of a new flourishing of this, t these types of teachings of love and spirituality and faith uh, and, and divine connection. So I feel very strongly that we're all a part of that, that we are all part of this 
uh, this point of the time returns. The time has returned. We're all here. And hopefully this time um, we're able to get it right. Uh, and we're able to, to keep moving forward with, uh, you know, bringing uh, consciousness, uh, bringing consciousness forward and talking about it. And shows like this are, are critical uh, to this, these kinds of understandings continuing to spread and to grow and to bring people into a, a place of higher consciousness and divine connection and, and real happiness and community. Well, you know, I really, I, I believe that there really are um, a lot of the writings out there that, that just haven't been broken into the public venue yet. I, a credit to the Catholic Church for preserving the records and not totally destroying them, but, but you know, a, a bad mark because they are secreted so that they aren't available to us. Right. And, and so when, when material like this comes out, when, when the documents, I, you know, for those that, that aren't familiar with um, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail material, you want to, you want to give a little bit of a thumbnail about Ren Le Chateau and, and um the, the priest there and, and what happened and what he found and how it set us all sort of on a discovery uh, pathway? Well, oh yeah, this is a hard one to encapsulate. Um, there is this miraculous little village in the back of nowhere uh, in the foothills of the Pyrenees in the southwest of France called Ren le Chateau. And it was the focal point of this mystery um, which was, uh, which became a book, um, a, a, tr a trio of English researchers in 1984 wrote a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail about what was happening in this little village in France. Um, and the quick version is that there was a priest who lived in this village in the latter part of the 1800s. His name was Berenger Saunier. And he was uh, the parish priest and the parish church was named after Mary Magdalene. Um, there had been a church there uh, consecrated to Mary Magdalene for almost a thousand years. Uh, she is well revered in that in that part of the world. That is high Magdalene country. That's the place where they have caves where they say this is where she taught and streams where they say this is where she washed her clothes. Mary Magdalene is very live in the culture there. Um, the quick version of a long story is that this priest uh, discovers something when he is remodeling the church. And the big mystery is, what did he discover? Uh, and nobody really knows what he discovered. I write about it in The Expected One. Um, but it, he becomes an incredibly wealthy man. Um, enormous amounts of money begin to flow into his parish and into his hands. And he undertakes huge building projects. He, he paves the roads up to Rennes le Chateau, which is no mean feat. Uh, he builds uh, he builds a, a villa, he, re he rebuilds the church, he creates amazing things and stained glass in the church. Um, at the time of his death, they say that he had what would be worth now a hundred million dollars worth of building contracts. So the question always was, what did this priest discover at Rennes le Chateau and where did his money come from? Now, there are a lot of different versions of, of where his money came from and what he discovered. Uh, the most sort of, I think the most commonly accepted is he discovered some kind of documents and that those documents were likely genealogies which showed the French royal family and their history going all the way back genealogically to Jesus and Mary Magdalene. So the idea was that he had these documents that proved that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married and that their, their descendants um, were the basically the royal families um, of Europe were all descended from this particular bloodline. So this is where the whole idea of bloodline comes from. Mm -hmm. um, now, Rennes le Chateau in itself is also a very, very special place. It's a very powerful place. Um, it's one of these sort of vortex locations. Um, you know, it is said to be a place where um, you can, you know, as above, so below. They say that it's, uh, it is a place where you can access uh, the upper regions and the upper regions can access us. So a portal between heaven and earth, essentially. Very, very magical place, a place uh, where I have lived and, and loved. I met my, my second husband, Philip Coppins, there. Uh, we met in Rennes le Chateau, we married in Rennes le Chateau. Very, very important place for those of us who do this kind of work. Um, it has been the focal point uh, of this kind of work for a long, long time. Uh, and it's also been called the linchpin of duality. 
Um, it's It's been known as a place where very, very dark things have happened and very, very light things have happened um, for such a small, small village, which has a the village itself has a full time population of under 30 people. Uh, it's amazing that has, it has been so instrumental in human history. Yeah, no, it's it's phenomenal. And and I'm glad you brought brought up Philip because um, he he was he became a very important part of your life and he brought another layer of of um, insight, a, a, you know, not deeper, but another layer so that the two of you together um, were, were able to sort of pursue some of the material that you're talking about uh, with with greater enthusiasm than, than you would have had had you been doing it alone. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, you know, from the from the minute we met in Rennes Chateau, it was uh, it was kind of game on. I mean, it was within a couple of days when we both realized, um, you know, we were finishing each other's sentences and we had been doing the same research without knowing each other uh, for many, many years. And, you know, he had written books, which I had used for references. And, you know, there were just so many, so many connections. And he was so incredibly brilliant. And and I know you know a few things about this, Barbara, about <laughs> it's like to have a partner who is very different uh, in, in, in his thinking uh, than you are. And, and, and what a beautiful compliment that becomes because Philip was very cerebral and very scientific and, and looked at everything from a very cerebral point of view. And I come from the, you know, the far more spiritual and, and heart centric side. So when we worked together, um, we had this amazing balance, this real male, female, um, you know, balance. And I don't just mean that in terms of, of, you know, gender in our relationship. I mean that in terms of the energies that we brought to mm -hmm. what we were researching, um, because he, he brought that sort of very, you know, buttoned down cerebral research piece, which I also have to an extent. Um, but I also showed him how to open his heart more uh, into looking at these, these, these mysteries in, in, in a different way. So whereas when I met him, he was still trying to investigate, um, it, well, in, until he died, he was investigating the story of Renly Chateau and where was the treasure buried and, and where was it found and those types of things. Whereas I became far more interested in the story of the priest, Berenger Saunier, and the woman who was his partner, who history recalls as his housekeeper, um, but, it, you know, in reality, they had this amazing committed relationship. And so, you know, I've always said the real treasure of Renly Chateau was the relationship between these two people and what they built together and what they were preserving together. Um, and just for the audience who doesn't know anything about Renly Chateau, I want to say um, that even Thomas Jefferson visited Renly Chateau. There are actually... Um, there's actually a letter that he writes to his daughter from the region. Um, so there are people who came from literally all over the world to visit this little teeny tiny place in the back of the French Pyrenees because it is known to be an incredibly powerful and important place. It has magic, you know, and, and you, know, I, you, you, you can't you can't truly explain magic un unless you've experienced it. So. Right. And and what I find amazing is um, his his partner is the only one he shared the secret with, and she took it to her death. Absolutely, she uh, she absolutely she took it to her grave, and um, and you know she she was an amazing character, and there are still there are still people who live in Rennes -le Chateau who knew her, um, who who knew her when she was when they were when they were children, or who have stories of Marie living you know in Rennes -le Chateau because she outlives him. Um, by many, many years, you know, this is a, this is also, um, this is a theme in my books, uh, that, th that these women outlive the men and are left to carry on, um, this legacy. So where they once had a legacy as a couple, it happens so frequently that women are widowed and then have to carry on the legacy themselves. Um, and, you know, as I was writing these books, of course, it never occurred to me that I would ultimately, um, end up in that same profound cycle, uh, but I'm in it. And uh, so, you know, it's been a kind of an amazing journey of watching my life imitate my art. Well, not only that, but but you truly are living it because when, when he passed away, you still have him to communicate with so that so that there really is no death. That, that you know, yes, there's another dimension, and but there is communication. It's there, it, it, it can't be denied. And, you know, you, you can't, um, it's not something that, that you demonstrate, you know, just 
for the crowd, but it, but it is a real aspect of your life and continues to be. And, you know, you are, you said, I think you said in, in something you wrote me that, that you are writing a book about um, the afterlife and communication with, with him called I Life have, Conquers All. Uh, I'm writing a book called Love Conquers Death. And okay. the reason it's called Love Conquers Death is that um, that motto comes from Rosslyn Chapel. Uh, there is a, a beautiful tomb outside of Rosslyn Chapel. It is the tomb of the fourth Earl of Rosslyn and his wife, who were also beloved partners. And there is a, a beautiful carving of an angel over their tomb, and the carving says, Love Conquers Death. And uh, one of Philip's uh, many funerals, he had, you know, I always say that uh, he had, we had one wedding and four funerals, because for those who are not aware, Philip and I were married on July 22nd, 2012. Uh, he got sick at Thanksgiving and he died uh, the day before New Year's. So um, I lost him very, very quickly at the age of 41 to uh, a, a very fast acting, terrible cancer. Um, and things happened very quickly. And, and we had four funerals for him in different parts of the world. And one of them was at Rosslyn Chapel because uh, of his personal community and, and dear friends, a number of them were in Scotland. And, um, and so that, uh, that, Love Conquers Death uh, imagery has always struck me. Uh, and I have a Love Conquers Death Facebook page, which I want to tell people about. Um, if you go to facebook.com forward slash Love Conquers Death, one word, that should take you to my Love Conquers Death page, which is uh, still, I'm still getting it started. It's still in the infancy stages where I'm talking about, um, you know, this whole idea of what happens after death. I mean, I was, as I'm sure you can imagine, I was absolutely destroyed uh, by what happened with Philip. Um, and it was so shocking because, you know, we were Indiana Jones and Marion Ravenwood. I mean, we were on top of the world. We were climbing the Bosnian pyramids and we were newlyweds and, you know, all these amazing things were happening in our lives. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, he gets, you know, irreversibly sick and it happens very, very quickly. Um, but what I wanted to say is um, in the last three days of his life, he became very lucid, became very clear. And he said to me, you have to let me go um, because this is part of the plan. I have to go over there. Um, I, have to, I have to go because I can help you and I can help this mission from the other side better than I can from here. I can protect you and Shane, who's my youngest son, I can protect you and Shane and I can participate in this work unshackled and without the limitations of being in a physical body um, from the other side. So you have to let me do that. I have to go. Um, and it took me, I'm not going to say that I was able to accept that immediately, um, that I was, you know, so such a master that I could say, yes, of course, honey, you know, no sure. problem. Uh, <laughs> I was absolutely devastated and non-functional for about two years. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I ultimately ha did come into, once I got through the worst parts of my grief and my anger and my devastation and all the things that come with this, um, I ultimately began to realize that um, he was absolutely right. And it was at that stage, a full two years after he passed, that I started to get... Um, I started, he started to make contact with me uh, in a way that he hadn't. And, and to back up, um, I was, one of the things that I was really angry about when he died was that he was contacting everybody else. You know, I was getting <laughs> messages from mediums and psychics and, and amazing messages, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, things that I knew that like, this is real because this, you know, they can't know this. They don't know that Philip would have said it this way, or there was a code word or something in it that made sense to me. And I was like, that's all great, but why isn't he talking to me? Why can't I hear him? Why isn't he in my life? And it took me a while to realize that I was the reason that he wasn't, because I was still in this, this place of such deep pain and grief and anger that I had to process all that before I could move into this phase of realizing what he always says to me now, which is, he's just in the next room. He's mm -hmm. here. You know, he's just here differently. And I do feel him and talk to him uh, and have some amazing conversations with him. And um, he shows himself in very amazing ways. And, and one of the things that, that I really wanted to talk about with this is I think now more than ever, we're seeing this. 
we're seeing this concept of afterlife communication in such a big way. You have wonderful books like The Afterlife of Billy Fingers, where you know Annie Kagan wrote this wonderful book about having this conversation, this communication with her brother in the afterlife. And it was a very brave book for her, I think, because you know this was not in her comfort zone. She wasn't like us. She didn't live in this world that you and I live in, um, where this is not so abnormal. But more and more people are, are having these kinds of contacts and, and writing about it and talking about it. And I think that's because it is time now. The earth is at critical mass and we do need to do our best to make it better and to move it forward and to raise levels of awareness and consciousness. And we don't need all the help we can get. And you know what? Sometimes I think that means we need the people who are doing really great work here to move to the other side so that we are working together in both places. And as hard as that has been for me to accept, I now can it can accept it with open arms and be be happy about it and embrace it. And hopefully I can write something in this book, Love Conquers Death, that helps people who are who are grieving to maybe move into a new space of saying, OK, now, how do I move into a space of still being able to understand that I can still be connected to my loved one um, and we can still work together? Because Philip and I work together every single day. He is still my partner in all of my projects. He's just in the next room. Oh, yeah. And don't, don't you think, though, that part of it is you had such an intense connection while you were here that you created a bond that, that became your link when, when you were separated just by dimension? Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, and, you know, that 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 is something I think that that especially the younger generations um, need to know that that the kind of connection that you, you that hopefully you get in a marriage is one that takes time and intensity to to forge. And and if if you if you don't take that time to create a, a good friend and respect and trust and and then love that 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 you don't have the strength and the power to go through the things that, that life will challenge you with right well and i go back to the book of love and what it says in the book of love and it also says in, in some of the gnostic gospels that sacred union comes from a place of trust and consciousness Mm -hmm. and, and, and and that's the thing that we should be teaching our young people. We should be teaching them about trust and consciousness. Um, you know, we should be talking to them about these kinds of things. We should be spending a lot more time um, with our kids, helping them to understand what healthy relationships are, um, you know, and, and, and what they look like and, and, and modeling that for them. Um, you know, I have boys and, and that's always, you know, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a challenging time to be a young man in the world in the 21st century. Um, particularly, I live in Hollywood. I live in Los Angeles. So, you know, there's lots of lots of temptations to do things that are certainly outside of things like trust and consciousness. Um, and I, I just, you know, one of the things that I, I where I put my energy in that I, I really am praying for are more projects for younger people that bring them into a place of, you know, gaining access to some of this material, like material that is in the Book of Love, like material that talks to them about merging souls and spirit, um, not taking sex lightly um, because it is a merger um, of two spirits at the same time that it is a merger of two bodies and that we need to be responsible about that because it can be the most amazing thing in the world, but it can also be the most damaging thing in the world if it is abused. And so these are the kinds of things that I'd love to see more consciousness and spirituality coming into the way that we teach our teenagers. Oh, yeah. And but but don't you think in a way the problem is parents don't understand it, so they're not teaching it or living it. So where do the kids get it? You know, it, it's it's sort of like there has to be a re-education, but it has to be at an adult level so that the adults can kind of share it as as their children get older and older um i have a, a my son my baby is uh going to be 50 years old next year wow <laughs> yeah i don't know how that happened <laughs> he, he got older i got younger what can i say um but but yeah and he's got a a, a marriage that's been you know 21 years 22 years so so hopefully i was part of what helped him to understand uh, 
the bonding that needs to take place, the, the, the consciousness bonding, not, not just the physical, but, but all the rest of it. It's, there's, it, it's an amazing process. And, and if you don't go through that process, uh, something's wrong. I know when, when, I, met my, when I met Patrick, um, we, we spent seven months just talking on the phone, getting to know each other and understand each other. And, and so it was when we, when we finally actually physically met, of course, everybody thought I was crazy. Um, it it was it was kind of like we had already, we knew each other, right? So so it's a matter of of you know working at relationship and relationship is something you constantly work on. It's not just a well we're married now we don't have to work any longer. That's when the real work starts. So you're absolutely right though. I I think that 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 none of this is taught anymore and. And it's the parents' responsibility to to be the example for the children because they are the pattern from which they are going to create their lives. That's that's the only pattern they know. So un- unless you give them a good pattern, uh, you you almost condemn them to not being successful. Well, it's true, and we have to continue to do our best to provide material for um, the parents as well. And hopefully, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing with my books. You know, I'm trying to provide examples of beautiful relationships, relationships that are held in trust and consciousness. Um, you know, Philip and I certainly tried to provide that example when he was alive. It was, you know, one of the things we we did everything together and we had a radio show together. And, you know, that was a, a big part of what what we were, you know, what we were, were here to do. So we just have to we just have to keep on the path and and continue to tell these stories. Um, and uh, hopefully they will reach the people they need to reach. Well, it, what I love is, of course, they will, and and you know, even if even if we're no longer around, um, it you know, the, you have recordings that are so that so that it's um, it, it's it's a unique experience for sure. It, uh, there was a while where I was I was actually very upset that that uh, you know today our society. In 3,000 years, none of these buildings will be standing. There, you know, what will be left to tell of our time? And I realized that 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 it would be the electronics. That 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 energy was out there in the ether, whether or not even the planet exists. The the, the recordings, the electronic stuff, is still out there. So so it, it's 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 amazing. We are leaving our mark on in the, within eternity. Um, there is one book that, that we haven't talked about that I haven't read, and yet I, I, it's, it's going to have to be on my list, and that's The Ballad of Tantin. Tamlin, The Ballad of Tamlin. Tamlin, yeah. The Ballad of Tamlin is a, is a novella um, about, that deals with Scottish history um, in the 15th century, uh, 1400s. But it is based on um, what, what is known as a Scottish border ballad. So the Scots um, told, kept a lot of their storytelling in song. And uh, this particular ballad is about an interaction with, uh, between humans and the fairy kingdom. And um, it's, a, it's quite an amazing, uh, it, it's, it's an amazing story. And I, I first heard the song many, many years ago. It was done by a, a British folk band called Fairport Convention. Uh, the Ballad of Tam Lin, and you can listen to it on YouTube. A, a woman named Sandy Denny, amazing vocalist, who who brought this old ballad uh, back to life and, and did a recording of it in the 70s. And I was always really fascinated by it. And then um, when I when I met Philip, um, he lived in Scotland, very close to uh, Tam Lin country. And I was so excited um, about it that I said, you know, I've always wanted to see these places that, that are, are discussed in the in the song. So let's investigate. But the, the quick version of the Ballad of Tamlin is it's about um, it's a it's a it's a fairy tale in reverse because it is the woman who saves the man in this story, um, which I one of the things that really fascinated me, uh, this man who had been abducted by the fairy queen and was a prisoner um, of of the fairy cultures. And she had to find a way to win him back or and save him uh, from a terrible fate. So I was always kind of fascinated by this fairy tale in reverse. But as I began to do the real digging into the story and spending a lot of time in, 
in Scotland where this concept of fairy cultures is very real. You know, people who don't spend time in the Celtic world, I mean, I'm, I'm Irish and Scottish in, in, in my heritage, have spent a lot of time, a lot of my life in Ireland, um, where this concept of fairy tale uh, is very real. Um, so, I mean, there are places in, in Scotland and in Ireland too, where they'll say, you know, you don't walk there because that's, that is a fairy path. It's bad luck to walk through it. There are legends in Scotland of people disappearing um, completely and never returning again uh, because they walked into the fairy pass. And this is, this is really serious business. Um, so when I started getting sort of digging into this in Scotland, I was so fascinated by how real these stories still were in the, the landscape of the Scottish border country. Um, and I also realized that this story has a really big twist in it that no one was seeing. And I wanted to write that story and write that twist because this whole concept of what happens between humans and the fairy world has been misunderstood. And uh, I, I wanted to, to, to kind of play with that a little bit. And so that was um, how I wrote The Ballad of Tamlin. It's only available as an ebook. I, I, um, it was something that I did. And to be honest with you, I threw it up onto, uh, onto the internet as an ebook um, in September of 2012, fully expecting that I was going to do an entire series of these kinds of books and publish them properly. Um, but all of this was happening uh, a few weeks before Philip got sick. And so my, my path changed and I, I, you know, have kind of left uh, Tamlin out there to dry and, and I, I hope to pull it back. I actually want to expand it. I want to make it a bigger book. I want to, uh, I want to make it longer because I think it deserves more time. Uh, and ultimately publish it properly, um, but it is currently available in its ebook form. Now, and a portion of the profits go to charities to don't you know is donated to charities supporting women and children, right? A, a portion of everything I do goes into charities. Um, my personal um, sort of passion for throughout my life, since I was 21 years old, uh, has been the cause of human trafficking. Um, so I have always donated to anti-slavery organizations and organizations that help to rescue women and children um, from human trafficking. And uh, I think that that is still a cause that um, needs as much attention as we can bring to it. There are still 29 million people enslaved around the world. And, uh, and, and it's something that I, I, you know, I still feel very, very strongly about. And I, uh, as long as there is breath in my body, I will talk about it and I will uh, raise money for it. Well, I totally agree with you. I, I feel that there is so much that go with all of the, the media that we have out there. It seems to me so strange that the real important things aren't covered, yet the slips of the tongue of politicians are. And there's, no. <laughs> there, there's I mean, the, the, there's focus on, on, on Haiti and all of the stuff that's gone on there. They haven't, they haven't recovered from that, 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 that tragedy that, that struck them. No. Katrina victims haven't all recovered. I mean, and, and that's just too in this country. I mean, you can take it overseas and, and it's, it's awful that, that what becomes a, a 30 second to a minute, you know, blurb on the news is then, you know, shoved aside because something else has happened that's, that's you know, even more titillating. So, and, and nobody goes back to the victims that are still trying to survive. And it, it's, it's heartless. It's just terrible. No, you know, a, a huge part of, I think, what we all have to stand for is the idea of service. Um, you know, I have, uh, I wrote a nonfiction book about prayer called The Source of Miracles. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I am. Um, and uh, in The Source of Miracles, I, I talk about um, how the Lord's Prayer, which is 55 words, is broken down into pieces, um, how the, the Cathar people in France use the Lord's Prayer as a daily practice. It wasn't just a, a prayer that, you know, they, they would mumble off by rote, but like so many people do. You know, we're all taught this prayer for if we come from any kind of Christian environment, of course, because it is the one prayer that is given to us by Jesus. But, um, but there is a, a piece of that prayer which is really calling us uh, to, to service. It's really calling us to create heaven on earth. And so one of the things that you know, I, I think that we all need to do is we all need to step into that, that element of service and say, you know, what can I do? No matter what it is, it doesn't have to be money. It can be time. 
what and, and whatever it is that calls you. But I think if every one of us just takes a little bit of time to say, how can I serve this planet and these people? Um, how can I serve to make the world a better place? If everyone just took a few minutes out of their lives um, to, to focus on this concept of service. And sometimes it's just about becoming aware. Go out and read some of the stories of what's happening in the world. Um, you know, figure out what you can do um, to, to become more aware, more involved, more interested in whatever it is. It can be, you know, you might have a passion for animals. You might have a passion for children or for the arts, but whatever you can do to make the world a little bit better while you are here, I think that you have an obligation to do that. I think we all have an obligation to do that. And, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, uh, aside from life itself, the most precious thing you can give someone is your time. And, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, anybody can whip out a checkbook or a credit card, but when you're, when you're actually taking the time to, to learn about something and then do something about it, that, that's, that's a greater gift. And sometimes, you know, people say, well, I don't have enough money for myself. How can I possibly, you know, do anything? And, and the reality is just what we're doing here tonight, just talking about something puts it out there. And, and other people will pick up, you know, uh, they'll pick up your books and read them out of curiosity or, or they will, they will look at some of these things through different eyes and, and do their own research and find out their own inner truths. But, but giving is the important thing that that's, that's why, you know, why Scott works here, why I work here, where all of the other people who are here work here, because it gives us an opportunity to put stuff out there so that people who haven't had the wherewithal to actually do the research can get a bigger clue from what you and I are saying and then go for it. It may trigger something, it may awaken something in them, but but it, it's sort of like giving your time to help the truth be recognized in, in, in our own lives is a very important gift and, and what you've done with your books is just amazing. Well, thank you. Time is a renewable resource. We get more of it every day, you know? Yes. Um, so, <laughs> so it's something, it's easy to say, I don't have time to do that. But, you know, it, it really is all about, you know, realizing that time is a renewable resource. We do get more of it. And, um, we, you know, we can utilize our time um, to, do, to do really, really good things in the world. Um, I did want to talk about for a minute, if I can, I just want to talk about the fact that I am writing this book about Anne Boleyn. I'm so excited about it. Um, because I think that she is the poster child of the, the maligned and misunderstood uh, woman. I, I think that no one has had more terrible, terrible material written about her um, than Anne Boleyn. And, um, and I think it is really, really time uh, in the 21st century for us to look at her differently. And I just, um, I just really wanted to say that I'm, I'm so excited. I have been working for many, many years on finding a new version of her story. And I want to say that when I initially came to this idea that I had to write about Anne Boleyn, I rejected it. I didn't want to do it. I said, you know what? There's too much stuff out there about the Tudors already. You know, they don't need me. Um, I don't know. There doesn't need to be another book about Anne Boleyn. Um, and the more I dug into this, the more I realized there absolutely does need to be one because this was a powerful spiritual woman. Um, who is not remembered for any of her spiritual contributions. And what I want to go back to is what you said earlier in the show, which is this idea that the Bible had originally been written, um, was only allowed to be written or published in, in Latin and Greek so that it could only be interpreted by the clergy. Common people were not allowed to have the Bible in their vernacular language. And Anne Boleyn is one of the people who fought to change that. Um, this was a passionate cause for her to bring the Bible into English so the people of her court could read the words of Jesus by themselves. This was something that was heretical. It was punishable by death, but it was something that she was very, very passionate about. She was an incredibly powerful, generous, charitable woman who spends the most important formative years of her life in France. And this is all part of the story that has been lost. And this is where the connection is ultimately to Anne Boleyn and everything else that I've written about that. Um, we know everything that I've written about the Magdalene line, this line of women who come through Europe and have this amazing training. Um, these powerful noble women who have this information. 
Well, they were Anne's teachers. Anne Boleyn is taught by and mentored by some of the most powerful, controversial, and fascinating women who ever lived in Europe. And this aspect of her childhood and her youth has been completely overlooked um, by traditional scholarship. And so when Philip was alive, what we did is we spent a lot of time in Europe looking at and from the point of view of Anne in Europe, which is something that no one had really done. So we went to sources, uh, Philip spoke four languages, so he was also my, you know, my built-in translator. We went to sources in, in Flemish because her, the first school she went to was in Belgium. Um, we went, looked at sources in French, we looked at sources in German, we looked at sources in Italian, and we came up with a version of what Anne would have been exposed to and how that would have in, influenced her um, that tells a completely different story of who this amazing woman is and the fact that she has been remembered instead as this, uh, you know, as, as the, the vixen home wrecker um, who was either A, just a, t a pawn of her family, or B, um, you know, a terrible opportunist. Um, all of those portraits of her are wrong and false. This is a powerful woman who set out to create a spiritual revolution. Uh, and she does that. And maybe she doesn't do it so gracefully at times. But she, cha <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but she changes the world. Um, and her relationship with Henry changes the world. And a lot of people don't realize that they were together for almost 10 years. And it wasn't always bad. Um, so, you know, this is a story that I am you know, thrilled to finally tell. It is a story that needs to be told in the 21st century because women are still being maligned and misunderstood for being powerful and spiritual uh, in our world today. And, uh, and, and Anne sort of remains the poster, the poster girl for that. Um, so just thank you for letting, letting me go on and on about that. I'm so passionate about her story. Um, I, I can't wait to tell it. Well, yeah. And, you know, I, I know a little bit about them and, Actually, it, it, it always fascinated me, you know, how she really was into understanding scripture and she was into, but she was also into a great deal of charity work as well. And her, I think her charity work is actually what got her killed, to be honest with you. Um, you know, when, you know, as, as the monasteries were being dissolved and all this money was coming into the coffers, Anne wanted to take the money that was coming out of the churches and put it into charitable programs. And it was Henry's, you know, immediate cronies, specifically Thomas Cromwell, who did not want that to happen. Their point of view was, stay out of this lady, this is our money. You know, we're going to do whatever we want with this. And Anne was saying, look, this money needs to be used to benefit the people of England. And she wanted to use that money for charitable causes. And I believe that it was Anne trying to channel the money away from people like Cromwell and into charitable causes that ultimately got her into very, very big trouble. Oh, I, I would totally agree because I know she was into orphanages and hospitals and, and you know, she was trying very hard to, to, to help the people. I think she was probably more loved by the people than history has admitted. Well, you know, the, the problem with Anne, which is a problem that we see often in history, is that the sources um, that tell us about her that exist and which are accepted by academia are sources that were her enemies. So, you know, positive material about Anne Boleyn during her time doesn't exist anymore because it was dangerous. It was eradicated. Um, you know, a lot of things were, a lot of letters were burned. A lot of material about her was destroyed. So what we have left is material that was written by people who were paid to discredit her. The primary source of information about Anne Boleyn is the, you know, basically the, the ambassador to Spain. So you have someone who is working for Catherine of Aragon, who is working for Spain, and he is writing prolifically about Anne Boleyn. And this is the material that is now used to describe her character. Well, this is a man who never even called her by her name. He called her the, the concubine and the prostitute and the whore and all of these names because he despised her. But history historians in an academic setting will say, well, yes, it's biased, but you know we have to believe him because he was there and he was in the court. And this is the problem with history is that academia doesn't stop long enough to really look at an agenda. You know, when we are looking at stuff that is agenda driven, we're never going to get the truth. And when the truth is something that is destroyed, 
then, you know, all we have left is the propaganda. Well, you, you know, know, if if you look at, you know, politics today, you think, oh, my God, it can't get any worse. But the reality was back in that day, um, the, 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 um, the, the undercurrents and the conspiracies that were going on were far worse than what's going on today. Oh, um, they're unbelievable. I mean, and, 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 you know, the Spanish ambassador was very, very loyal to Catherine and Catherine got the short end of the stick too. Well, I, you know, I, I think Catherine is, a, is a, for me, Catherine of Aragon is a very, is a, is a very sympathetic character and I treat her with great sympathy um, in, within the story. But you know, what I say to people is you have to look at it. If you take, for example, regardless of where you stand in the current political climate, imagine if Hillary Clinton wrote a book about what's happening in America today. And Donald Trump wrote a book about what's happening in America today. But 500 years from now, only one of those books remains and the other one is destroyed. And then that one book is history. It's like, oh, this is what was happening in America in 2016. And we know that because this person was an important figure and was there. And therefore, we're going to accept this as history. Well, you better hope that your guy or your gal is the one whose book survives. Right? <laughs> well, so it's like. It's like Christopher Columbus. I mean, we got a day dedicated to him, and he was a mass murderer. Oh, I yeah. mean, <laughs> you know, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It, the the it, it, what is it? History is left to the victors. History is left. It is. It's absolutely written by the victors. And the farther back you go, the more true this is. Same thing with the Cathars. You know, there's so the books that are written about the Cathars are are completely misguided because the material that we have on Catharism that is accepted by academia comes from the Inquisition. So when you are taking the point of view of the people who are trying to kill your subject, who are genocidal against your subject matter, you can't assume that that material is going to be unbiased. Same thing when you're talking about a woman like Anne Boleyn, right? If it was if, if you were going to lose your head by supporting her, you're not going to write a lot of material um, saying that she was a good person. You're going to be very, very careful. Um, material that supports her as a good person goes away um, because it was important to make her look like she was a heretic and a whore and all these things that they, they called her in order to make it acceptable to butcher her for in fact being a strong, important spiritual woman. Well, you you have the same thing with Josephus. I mean, the Romans hired him. Right. He was writing for for the Romans, so he certainly wasn't going to report accurately about what he saw in his day, in his time. Well, I say in the expected one, and it's probably it's it's probably my most quoted line of any of my books, and it's even been on memes. The line that history is not what happened; history is what was written down. And we have to be able to look at that and understand that what happened and what was written down are very rarely the same thing. And history, the further back we go, is written not only by the victors, but by the wealthy, right? Because oh, yeah. you had to be educated. You had to be able to buy things like writing materials, etc. So the further back you go, the more you can be sure that history is only being recorded by people who have the wealth and the power to do so. And this is what we see over and over again. And that's why now, more than ever in the 21st century, we need to be looking at history with new eyes so that we can learn from it, so that we don't have to repeat the errors of history again, and we can move forward into a golden age of new consciousness. Oh, well, you know, right right away, you got two phrases that you have. One is is with those, with you know, with eyes to see and ears to hear. And then that other phrase, what is it? Those who... Um, don't pay attention to history are doomed to repeat it. Doomed to repeat it. Yeah. I, and, and, and and the the phrase that is on all of my books, which was the battle cry of the great warrior Queen Boudicca, the truth against the world. Yeah. Amazing. But before we are coming close to the end here, and I want to um, once more put out your website. It's it's www.kathleenmcgowan.com. Your Facebook, right. your Facebook is you know, www.facebook.com uh, forward slash love conquers death. Right. And um, you're, yeah. On, 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 I just want to go back to on my website. So it's Kathleen McGowan, M C G O W A N.com. And if you scroll down on the left, there is a place where you can get on my mailing list. So if you uh, want to hear more, 
um, I will, you know, I'll put you on my mailing list and I'll keep, uh, I'll cer certainly keep you posted. Um, Facebook is facebook.com forward slash love conquers death. Um, I also have an author's uh, page on Facebook. It's actually a discussion group. If you put in Kathleen McGowan, it will come up um, for the group and you can join that as well. And the other thing that we didn't go into, which is also fun, is that you have appeared on many, many, many ancient aliens uh, stories and one of my most favorite, um, you did talk to the people who were doing um, the Oak Island dig as well yes. at one time. Oh, it's probably a good thing that we didn't have time for that. Oh. <laughs> yes, I was on I was on season two of The Curse of Oak Island. I took uh, Marty Lagina and his son Alex um, through France and uh, Scotland to talk about the origin and origins of the treasure. In fact, we went to Renly Chateau. It's one of the places that uh, right. that, that we went um, for the show. It, you know what, being on that show was a lot of fun. I was really honored to do it. Um, but it's also been a, a little bit frustrating um, to continue to watch them dig in the wrong places. Yeah, I would think so. And I, I've got a feeling that they're gonna do it again for this season, but they're obviously, they're in a position to be able to do this and it certainly is a, a quest for them. Um, I just, you know, I, I get the feeling that that there is treasure there, but it isn't the kind of treasure they're seeking. Well, that's the, uh, you know, and, and that's the challenge. And I think that's a challenge for them too, because, and I think I was a challenge for them for that very reason, because um, they want, you know, they, they're the hardy boys, right? They want pirate treasure. They want stuff that's, that's fun and easy. They don't want spiritual treasure. Spiritual treasure uh, is complicated. Yes. Kathleen, thank you again so much, and I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara.